Welcome to Behind the Bastards, yeah. the only podcast with the personality of a staph infection. <laughs> no, 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 that's just me, Robert. Talk yeah, we're, we're, we're reading a one-star <laughs> review from iTunes. You're just an annoying lip smacker who needs to do better. <laughs> I, have I mean, been. look, who, who uh, f- for one thing, is it bad? Is a staph infection bad? There's upsides to staph infections. You that's get true. time off of work. Cool um, photographs. You have to, if you die, deal with a lot less bullshit on Twitter, you know? So again, right. staff infections are a really mixed bag. There's positive sides to it's staff infections. It's you know? honestly so fucking funny, and I have no idea what it means that I'm, like, not even mad. Like It's, it's yeah. extreme. It's, yeah. It's clever. It's fun to get roasted like that, where you're like, I yeah, that's we're like, very funny. Where you're like, I'm not quite sure what you mean, but you're you're not wrong. Right, it flows. <laughs> it's like it, the words flow, yeah. and it just—it's like I, it, nice yeah. Job. I I like a good. It's like it's like when you well, I'm getting into dangerous territory here. But when you read people <laughs> being like super shitty on some level, uh, from like 150 years ago, and it's like, well, this is sexist or racist, but man, people could put together sentences back then. Like oh, that's yeah, not yeah, a yeah. that's not a bad sentence, you know. <laughs> like it's yeah. it's horrible, but it's not a bad sentence. Right. People used to that. Yeah. These, yeah. these sh- shit posts were a lot more uh, <laughs> eloquent. People put, yeah. put a lot more work into their shit posts. Yeah, it's like H.P. Lovecraft racism. Well, it's like right. well, this is terrible, but man, quite, quite, <laughs> quite, a, quite a phrase. Wow, way <laughs> yeah. to create an entire lore around your racism. That's <laughs> yeah, exactly. Amazing. That's uh, that's so much more effort that people put into it these days. Right. <laughs> um, David Bell. That's me. That's you. You know, Hi. you know, you know, Dave, you know, what? <laughs> you know, you know, I don't know. You don't know. know, you know, Dave. Okay. You know, I think, I, know. I think Dave is going to love this topic. I hope he does. Um, I hope he loves it and I hope you hate it, Sophie. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I'm just an, an asshole. I'm a bad person. Mm-hmm. Just mm-hmm. biting the hand that stops me from committing a series of crimes that get us arrested and arrested in our podcast shutdown. Dave. Hi. <laughs> How do you feel about reality TV? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> mixed feelings. I don't. Yeah. Yeah. That's the right way to feel. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't watch most. Re- I don't find it no, interesting, but-, but I don't have anything against it unless something horrible was done behind the scenes, you know? Yeah. It's, it's like if, if everybody, if there's consent and everybody's cool, uh, then we're, we're good. We're good. Yeah. I do like, I do like the occasional like British bake off, mm-hmm. but I wouldn't consider oh, that sure. reality TV. Some might, I mean, it, some it is, might it is, say, it's unscripted, but yeah. am I right in saying that reality TV does have the personality of a staph infection? Yes. Yes, it and does. I, yes, where it's where it's gross and infectious, but also yeah. <laughs> you might get to take some time off of work, you which know, is to great. Enjoy it, yeah. So you know, I, I I'm not going to do this thing. This is going to okay. be kind of a loosey goosey episode. We're doing this right after the Kissinger episodes. Everybody's tired. Um, I'm not going to be one of these smarmy fucks who's just like shitting on the concept of reality TV to seem smart, right? Reality right. TV is broadly speak, it's junk food. You know, it is not good for you. But that said. I do a shitload of things that are bad for me. Yeah, I would also it's argue fine, that it's right? it's not new. Like no. game shows have always existed. There, there's, there's always there's... entertainment junk food. Like that fucking right. piece of trash Mozart, right? Like he's shit. Everyone knows he's shit. But he's like shit. people yeah. like to enjoy shit and that's fine. Um I like the Bloodhound gang, you know? Like we're not no right. nobody nobody in this show is going to be like again there's nothing bad or like you're not dumb because some of the smartest people i know like turn off from like getting their phd or whatever and like watch you know a a bake-off show or like big brother or some shit it's fine listen when we're done here i will Mm -hmm. be going online and ordering Mm -hmm. the the 4k release of moonfall Uh, i will be doing that and i I will watch the special features I mean, Dave, you've watched shit with me. One of my favorite things to put on is people hurting themselves horribly while skiing or base jumping. Yes. And I have I have since expanded to wingsuit crashes, some of which the people die in. Have, like I, some of, I, there's I, some gnarly wingsuit crash oh yeah, videos if you look. That's the old pink mist. But <laughs> oh, like, yeah, baby. <laughs> yeah. Have you looked into um, parkour? 
accidents? Oh, parkour accidents are great. If you really want to be harrowed, just type gun fails into Ooh. YouTube. There's some shit in there. Oh yeah. my God. There's this Wander video. Wander onto Live Leak and, and just Google and like type in gun yeah. fails. Yeah. There's some nasty. There's a dude who like put a bunch of Tannerite, which is this explosive. You shoot it and it blows up right. on a fucking lawnmower and shot it at close range and the blade <laughs> cut his leg off. Like it's. <laughs> Of course There's it some did. Shit. So, again, I'm saying this all not to celebrate my own crapulence, but, like, we all like some stuff that's the entertainment we equivalent like of, like, things, junk yeah. food, right? Um, so this isn't an ep- episode about, like, trying. To, I'm not trying to make the case that, like, reality TV is bad and you should feel bad for watching it. This is about the most fucked up things that have ever happened within the broad umbrella of reality or what you might call unscripted content. Um, there's not a particular thesis here. I just spent a lot of time reading about the worst things that have happened in reality TV, and I decided Ooh. to do a podcast. None of you can stop me, so deal with it. We'll probably do another episode in the future with more of these stories. This is exciting. <laughs> yeah. Before we start, I want to share my very favorite reality reality television story. And this is a story about a a reality TV show I enjoyed. So when I was in Iraq, this is like the second or the third, might have been the fourth time, I forget exactly which time it was. Um, But we're like, you know, when you're hanging out in a place like that, we're like going to refugee camps and like frontline positions. And in order to get to both, you have to spend time in like a bunch of random living rooms because that's where everyone's like posted up leaders of these camps these like different generals and shit they're all like hanging out in houses and so while you're waiting to get approval to go places you're just like sitting in like usually an air-conditioned living room with the tv on and a bunch of like guys with their guns and phones out and shit and one of the times we were out there this the same reality show kept going on it came on in like two or three different places and I don't know what the name of the show is. I have not brief Googling has not informed me of it, but the premise was that there was this host who would like take a rich guy out to the desert. Like he would, they would be like driving a caravan and there would be a contrived accident. And like one of the cases I remember this guy's like in a little motorcade and they get stuck in quicksand and his vehicle sinks and he has to like get out and he's like on top of the vehicle. And while that's happening, the host dressed as a Komodo dragon comes out and attacks them. Holy it's, shit. It was fucking insane. Like, I, I don't know what was, su- I, like, I'm sure there's elements of this that I was not grasping because there were no subtitles and I do not speak Arabic. Um, uh, but it was, it was wow. some of the wildest shit I've watched on TV. It was so I, good. I don't know what's scarier, being attacked by a Komodo dragon or a man dressed like one. Because yeah. they're both very It was sinister. a pretty good costume. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. It sounds like it's like Survivor Man or Man yeah. vs. Wild. But... I don't know what the point was supposed to be because on all of them, people just like react the way you would if you saw a Komodo dragon. Right. It's like, is, oh, it's, dear. It's, <laughs> God damn. Like, we're, we, America can't talk, mm-hmm. but we're like assimilated to our weirdness. Yeah. But it's kind of the same as when you watch like the Japanese pranks shows. Like yeah. The silent library where it's like. That it, you have to be quiet in a library and they mm-hmm. just like do fucked up shit to you. And if you make a noise, you lose. And, and it's like uh, that actually, I think got an American adaptation. Um, but like, it's that extra context of not understanding the language or the extra layer that's like makes it so perfect and bizarre. Mm-hmm. That, yeah. Oh man, I want to watch that so bad. I, I love that shit. Yeah, I, someone will find it now that we've talked about it and we'll find the clips. Please, Please do. I yes. would love to watch it again. Please. Um, anyway, Dave, on January 11th, 1973, PBS began to air the first of 12 hour-long episodes of An American Family, a television documentary about the Louds, an actual family, and this is probably the very first reality show in history. Now, the Louds were upper middle class and lived in Santa Barbara, and over 300 hours of raw footage of them was shot between May 30th and December 31st, 1971. The initial intent was just to kind of chronicle their daily lives, but during filming, the relationship between spouses Bill and Pat Loud broke down, and the show ends with both parents divorcing. Ooh. Cameras actually caught Pat asking for a divorce on camera. She tells Bill, you know there's a problem, and he responds, what's your problem? This was picked by TV Guide as one of the top 100 TV moments of all time. And in some ways, viewers have never moved on from the concept of watching unscripted life moments from rich people in California, right? Like, this this is, broadly speaking, still the, also, the, the heart of reality TV. What do you, do you think, and I don't know the answer to this, what yeah. they have 
had that divorce if they weren't on camera who knows i yeah. i have not watched the 12 hours it's, of the louds it's the, you know it's the double slit theory of like it, when observed will mm-hmm. they divorce it like, can't uh, help right <laughs> it can't help it probably gives people just a more sense of like i want drama in my life i mean yeah. i'm being uh, videotaped all the time mm-hmm. so like you start like thinking of your life like a tv show i imagine yeah, it doesn't seem like it could like make it e- easier for yeah. a, 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 a trouble within a, a marry a marriage to get solved. Um, but that said, I don't know anything about this particular couple. Um, but it's worth noting that like reality TV does not start f- far from where it is now, right? Like yeah. the yeah, this is this is still the heart of the of the genre. Um, so. Th- An American Family is hugely successful, and it immediately spawns an imitation by the BBC called just The Family. Now, An American Family is particularly notable because the Loud Family's oldest son, Lance, was probably the world's first openly gay TV star. Um, Like, he's open about being gay in the show in, like, 1973, which is pretty groundbreaking for the time. Right. Um, And he he dies during the AIDS epidemic, which is, uh, you know... It, 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 there's a whole is an interesting person whose life to study, right? This this show and he like there's nothing particularly problematic here. It's just an sure. interesting piece of history. I mean, it's it's yeah. your typical reality TV coming from PBS and BBC, as we all know. Yeah, uh, <laughs> classic. Yeah, classic <laughs> reality TV stations. So in the years that followed, the series went through the normal life cycle of a successful show. There's a handful of parodies, right? Like a bunch of different like sketch shows do parodies of an American family. There's like jokes and sitcoms of the day about moments that have happened in the show. Um, And then 10 years after it airs, there's an attempted reboot that doesn't do very well, right? Nothing at all weird here. This is like more or less what happens with every successful show. Sure. Most folks probably figured that was kind of it for the genre, which had yet to be named. People didn't talk about reality TV as a thing. There was just this one weird show that had existed. Mm. But a few perceptive individuals at the time recognized that something special was afoot. Anthropologist Margaret Mead published an essay in TV Guide. The New Yorker writes, quote, her contribution, which wasn't mentioned on the cover, appeared in the back of the magazine after the listings, tucked between an advertisement for Virginia Slims and a profile of Shelley Winters. Bill and Pat Loud and their five children are neither actors nor public figures, Mead wrote. Rather, they were the people they portrayed on television, members of a real family. Producers compressed seven months of tedium and turmoil into 12 one-hour segments, which constituted, in Mead's view, a new kind of art form, an innovation as significant as the invention of drama or the novel. And I think that's true no matter how you like reality tv like of course it's hit that point of cultural relevance already it's had that impact we we have the trump presidency because of reality tv you know yeah 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 the biggest shame about reality tv is when it's staged right like yeah it's the same appeal as a documentary um we'll get into that but yeah but I, i think that is interesting though just looking at it as like it's like the birth of the novel you know uh, yeah, it will yeah. be with us for a long time. Oh yeah, forever. And it, it, it'll it'll be so broad that I think it's like any genre where it sort of mixes with other genres. You know, yeah. uh, you could argue that just what we're doing, like TikTok uh, and like the the, the YouTube's mm-hmm. and so on, are offshoots of reality TV because we're following people's lives uh people are kind of filming genuine moments stage yeah. moments it's all it's all part of the same thing yeah and you know it's like with um and like with novels there's this you know there's horrible things you can tie to novels you know hitler was very influenced by the novels of carl may um you're you know, right Hit- we, we pro- yeah yeah we probably novels don't have caused hitler you're yeah, right novels caused hitler we probably don't have the bosnian genocide without the pelican brief obviously right um of course. you know but also there's good things that novels have brought us to um uh probably one one assumes good things i don't read books um you know right but i, 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 I do watch yeah. jack ryan movies i do watch jack ryan movies which have right. influenced my life in a number of ways yeah and i've mm-hmm. been told those mm-hmm. started as some sort of book yeah uh, the jack reacher like series read. really helped me make peace with the fact that um i'm incredibly jacked uh you know there's a right. lot of people it's I think. really hard to be yeah. like a jacked white dude exactly exactly um, finally yeah, jack- representation 
Exactly. It's it's wonderful. Yeah. This just like the yeah. Anyway, whatever. The, the, this bit's gone on long enough. So yes, <laughs> yes, it has. <laughs> so it's interesting then that it takes like Margaret Mead's right about the how influential this art medium is going to be, and it's interesting that it takes like twenty years from the first reality TV show before it turns into anything. Yeah. Like we have this idea for a long time before people figure out what to do with it. That. I mean, that happened sort of with found footage as well. Yeah. Because there were like, there was some found footage films and then we kind of went quiet and then the Blair Witch Project yeah. brought it back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Finally. The, which is, again, one of one of the great works of humanitarian. Right. Yeah. The Blair Witch Project, without which, I don't know. I don't we know. wouldn't have. Make a know, genocide VHS joke movies. for me. Yeah. 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 We wouldn't have the VHS movies, which have solved world hunger. Sure. Yeah, we'll go with that. So the first show to take reality TV forward was The Real World, which debuted in MTV in 1992. Rather than watching a family live their life and risk the chance that it might be boring, MTV decided to throw a bunch of young adults in a house and film what happened. Um, The show was successful, but it also was not like the kind of successful that on its own was going to spawn a world like changing industry, you know, Um, you know, the real world is kind of a proof of concept, but it's not as influential as some later things are going to be. The key to transmuting these particular, these peculiar documentary style shows into the thing that devoured television happened to be held in the head of a Fox executive named Mike Darnell. Prior to 2000, Mike's background had been producing shows like when animals attack world's scariest police chases and a variety of other premises now met by uh, random weirdo on youtube right like See, all the shows he gets started with are like the things i watch on random youtubers collect yeah that's oh yeah remember america's funny some videos where mm-hmm, it's like mm-hmm. that's youtube yeah um that's the only way uh you can watch people getting hit in the balls and mm-hmm. it's like we want that i i would argue reality tv is better than like when animals attack because that yeah like that was just youtube but it was youtube done in this like really serious tone yeah um i don't know if you like i i actually would see you could see people like attack videos on when animals attack would get reused on like world's funniest animals and they would just cover it in a different tone uh and like not mention the injuries you know like because they just it didn't matter it was just it was so schlocky um at least reality tv had like i don't know people involved a little more drama uh, yeah and I, I i think like because also I, I always felt gross about like america's funniest like a lot of these different video shows less america but like a lot of them would have like narration that was like generally kind of mean-spirited towards the people and i think it's right. much better to just have context-free loops of videos of people hurting themselves that's that's right. fine and it was a whole industry that yeah youtube uh, uh pretty much killed it's, it's it is kind of funny the degree to which that used to be the dominant thing on tv and now Heck. it's just random dudes i one of my favorite youtubers is the car crash channel which is just compilations of car accidents right yeah what else like you don't need a commentary no i don't need i don't need a word from anybody no Um, you just get in bed put on the car crashes and go mm -hmm, to sleep and go to sleep to the car crashes i love sleeping to train crashes there's nothing Mm -hmm. as soothing as watching a train hit a box truck yeah 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 yeah. (laughs) it just goes poof (laughs) <laughs> yeah, just yeah, just like your dreams. It just sends you, um, sends you right, right into yeah, the land of dreams. Deeply soothing. So, yeah. uh, Darnell is also the mind behind a two-hour special. So you know, this is how he gets to start doing these, like when animals attack. But then, it, near the end of the 1990s, he has an idea for a two-hour TV special with the title "Who Wants to Marry a Multimillionaire." Ah. So. This is going to be the show that births all of modern reality TV, really. Um, It airs on Fox on February 15th, 2000. In her book, Reality Bites Back, Jennifer Posner describes it this way. The special, which predated the game-changing Survivor, was a hybrid of Miss America and a mail-order bride parade. With executive (laughs) producer Mike Fleiss of Next Entertainment, Darnell brought 50 brides-to-be to to Las Vegas to be auctioned off to a complete stranger. They sashayed in swimsuits, tittered nervously, and answered pageant-style questions to assess their moral fortitude and sexual prowess in 30 seconds or less. Groom Rick Rockwell was hidden as he and the audience determined who deserved the biggest prize of all, a brand-new multi-millionaire husband. 
husband. Nurse and future Playboy centerfold Darva Conjur, Rockwell's eventual choice, got her first glimpse of her fiancé moments before they were legally wed on air. Nearly 23 million viewers tuned in. It's funny how when read that academically, it really is horrifying. It's a nightmare, right? <laughs> yeah. Like that's that's like a like an auctioning human beings off to a rich man. Yeah. It's, it's pretty uh, bad. Yeah, it's one of those where you just like, yeah, hey, you had to you had to be there, mm-hmm. I guess. It's like I think if you were there, a lot of people at the but no, but it was no, hugely successful. Were horrified there but, too. Yeah. yeah. But they well, were part of they watched it. Yeah, you reality know? TV created, I think, more than most things, the hate watch, right? Yes. Oh, God, uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, so the series got a 28 share, um, which is uh, basically uh, is a big hit in terms people don't use as much anymore to talk about success because in, in streaming has kind of... Like, yeah. who, who gives a shit about those old terms? Uh, but anyway, it's a big hit. Uh, Mike Darnell declared it the best show ever. Uh, or C- Chris Darnell... I think it was Chris. Shit. How many Darnells we got here? What's going Mike? On? No, it is. I think they're both Mikes. Are they both Mikes? I think they're both Mikes. I mean, Mikes. they're TV executives. Yeah. It all checks out. Mike Fleiss, who's the producer, later bragged, Mike and I knew that the National Organization for Women would hate us, that this would be the most controversial show ever. We thought it was all good, but it got so hot, so crazy red hot. They said it was the most talked about show sh- since Roots. It was the lead sketch on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> The most talked about show <laughs> also, since Roots. Hey, maybe your reality show that involves auctioning human beings shouldn't be compared to Roots. Yeah, no, <laughs> you might you not. might not want to be drawing attention to that, buddy. Yeah, <laughs> no, it, it, this it, this also begins this Ugh. problem, which yeah. is the it's it's kind of resonates all the way to the internet, obviously, which is like, ooh, they're talking about us, and it's like, yeah, yeah, that doesn't you know that's not a good measurement of whether or not something's good or not. But I mean, it is for their purposes because it's a of measurement course. of whether or not something can be worth money to advertisers, which is all that matters now. Right. Mm-hmm. Speaking of advertisers, Dave. Oh no. You know what? We can say whatever we want on this show because it gets advertisers. So I can say, for example, Dave, the has an island off the coast of Indonesia where you can make, grab a crude weapon, spear, you know, um, um, a, a club, you a know, rock. like you'd use on a seal, a rock, and you can hunt children in the open preserves that they keep on this island and they'll get cooked for you. You don't have to cook the child brisket yourself. Oh, takes care great. of that. That's I know. Right. It's the how opposite, much- actually, of how normally works. Yeah, right, 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 right. But that's, yeah. that's kind of the, the appeal there. That's the right? appeal, right? Normally, sends you the ingredients and you cook it on the child hunting island you provide the ingredients and cooks the food right because that's the most fun part of that process Mm -hmm. of the Mm -hmm. child hunting process right how much does it cost what does it go for oh i mean you know you you have to donate a significant amount to coke industries but but really dave can you put a price on hunting children on an island off the coast of indonesia i mean no but also yes if you're right like well they, yes they they, they do yeah. they do they do but if you sign up for their meal box plan you'll be entered into a raffle to win a spot on the next oh. yacht over to the child hunting island which is worth quite a bit so here's here's our sponsors oh we're back we're back and we're talking about the only mattress made entirely with linen stolen from the graves of dead Egyptian peasants. That's right. Well, is named because the ghost of dead Egyptian peasants lingers inside each mattress. You know, that's the guarantee. Yeah. I mean, what are they doing with all that linen? Nothing. There nothing. Dead? Tons of wasted linen. Yeah. It's, that sounds super sustainable. Yeah. Good exactly. for the environment. Exactly. There's so much carbon wasted by getting linen that doesn't come from Egyptian peasants who were buried in lost desert cities. Right. Um, steals those corpses and passes the carbon savings on to you. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's convenient. It's mm-hmm. good for the environment. It's great for uh, the environment. Yeah. And it's affordable. Is there a promo code? Can we make it even more affordable? Yeah. Promo code bastards. And they'll throw in a free ounce of mummy dust, which <gasps> if I, if my 1890s medical textbooks are anything to go by is useful in a variety of ailments. Dave. Yeah. You could at least snort it. Mm-hmm. And you least. got the grip. You've got the, the shallots, the shingles. It, yep. It'll cure them all. Mummy dust. Yep. Sprinkle it on your mac and cheese. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, it's delicious. Mm-hmm. 
Th- yeah. That was like three and a half minutes of a... H- how we do it? Are you happy, Sophie? I Did you get it. what you wanted? <laughs> I said, that bit's getting old, so you made a worse one? Yeah, it's great. <laughs> that's 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 how what I've been doing since the <laughs> bit, Sophie. Yeah. I missed the <laughs> bit. Well, too bad. So, <laughs> you probably won't be surprised to learn, Dave, that a show that was premised on basically taking the idea of an arranged marriage and making it television would turn out to have been unethical in some way, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) So they do this whole competition, right? Some lady wins this marriage to this fucking multimillionaire Rockwell, but they never consummate their marriage. And for a very good reason, the woman Conjure has it annulled because she learns that Rockwell has a long history of violence against women. Mm. Um, So... You know, good call on on her part. Um, yeah. It comes out like right as the show comes out that his former girlfriend had filed a restraining order against him for vandalizing her car, breaking into her home and repeatedly physically assaulting her. Good God. She stated he said he would find me and kill me. Also, Rockwell's not a multimillionaire. But that hardly seems like the primary issue here. Right. Who who would have thought that a guy who goes on a TV show to uh, look to, to like essentially buy a woman from an auction? Yeah. Uh, would be a liar and uh, a violent abuser. Who would have thought? Who would guess? Who and would a guess? Scumbag. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> So his his former girl, yeah, um, so all this hits the press right after the show comes out, and it's a big problem for Fox, because, again, this is 2000, so there was just a little bit of shame left in the right. world. <laughs> this was back when we yeah. cared. It was, it was like the reservoirs in Southern California. There was still this, like, tiny layer of water. Right, it, it's yeah. not going to be there in a couple of years, you no, know, the just like it's the, the water hope. in Southern California, but it was still a little bit there now. Yeah. You could kind of see the boats that didn't really have enough water, but there was at least something, you know? Right. Yeah. Right. You could pretend um, like, oh, it's just a dry, dry The spell. rain will come back. It'll be all right. Yeah. yeah. It'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> there's a little bit of shame and it causes a problem for Fox. Darnell tells a reporter, this is the worst day of my life. Wow. Um, what a great guy. Um, he gets excoriated by media who, by the way, like all of these journalists yelling at them were a lot of the same people who had been like raving over how groundbreaking the show was and who would, who would go on to celebrate other horrible reality thing. So whatever. Um, but in private, like he, he pretends that this is a horrible day for him in public in private. He is ecstatic. Fleiss later recalled that his first reaction was quote, great, more publicity. Mike said, we got to get out in front of this. I'm like, absolutely. Fuck. It's a restraining order. Let's get an interview with the girl. We'll put it on uh, as part of the, as part of the special. We had a whole plan because that's the way we like it. Because that's the way we like it. <laughs> what an amazing kind of dude. <laughs> I love it because we had it all as a plan because, and then something in his, the shame center of his brain like kicked in mm-hmm. and like, like uh, turned it into, because that's the way, the way we, like, we it. like it. Cause yeah. that is just his ego protecting himself mm-hmm. from something he knows. I think somewhere deep in, him. you shouldn't do this. Yeah. That, that yeah. He is a bad person. Yeah, yeah. When it, when you become aware that on your show where women are auctioned off to the highest bidder, the guy buying the auction was a spousal abuser on a horrific, uh, kind of level of abuse and also lying about being rich. You should be like, well, huh, maybe I should rethink some things about like, not just the show, but my life, you know? uh, Here's the thing is that I don't know much about how the biz works, the uh, specifically the reality TV biz, but I imagine that when you're casting reality TV, you're looking for outrageous people who are willing to do whatever on camera. Yes. And I'm not saying they all are i'm just saying that that type of person tends to have some personal problems yeah problems, uh, let's say a higher or, level sure yeah yeah again not all of them not all yeah. of them it's just that i can see why that would say attract people who are problematic in a lot yeah. of ways and so yeah it's I, I i imagine that's why you have several stories similar to this uh of reality tv where it's Yeah, it comes out that these people have done something horrifying. And it's like, yeah, because you barely vetted them. They're they're not a professional performer. uh, And you stuck them on TV and made them a star. Yeah. It's not the best thing to do. No, it's like, you know, Dave, I don't don't have a lot of shame 
Um, obviously, same, like I think every, it, it, we, we, we both chose entertainment as career, so we probably have a lower shame threshold than a lot of people. Yeah, of um, course. But like, I've, I, like every now, like on Twitter, I'll just like get see a tweet that I think is funny, and I'll share it, and then someone will like inevitably be like, "Oh, you know this guy did this horrible thing," and I'm like, "Well, no, I didn't. It was just a random person on Twitter." But then I feel right. bad about it for the rest of the day. It's incredible that this guy can be like, "Oh, we filmed a whole several hour long TV special with like." A, a man who beat the shit out of his girlfriend and has a restraining order against him. Ah! <laughs> like, right. Just that yeah. complete lack of shame. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. I envy it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it would make some things easier, like getting access to a Lamborghini. Yeah. That's I was why, about to like, say, getting uh, money, <laughs> getting money. It makes that a lot easier. Yeah. And then you um, make YouTube videos about how, telling people how to get money mm-hmm. and you tell them to buy your book, mm-hmm. which also will help them pick up women. That's another kind of guy without much shame. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and also this does lead to all that because the pickup artist culture is heavily related to reality TV show and that show with what was a mystery? What, what was it called? Uh, uh, I assume it was mystery because that's, that's one of them guys. Yeah. He got, he, he definitely artists. was in a bunch of reality shit. So when this all blows up and there's this big backlash against who wants to marry a multimillionaire, everyone kind of assumes that, um, Darnell is going to get fired. Fox cancels the rebroadcast of the show. And they had been talking about turning it into a series cause it was a huge hit and they declined to, um, and they promise never Fox promises to never be a part of any similar show in the future, which is extreme, <laughs> extremely funny. Like, wow. yeah, uh-huh, Fox. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> So, and it's worth noting that even while the heat is on, other networks, as soon as Fox is like, well, I guess we weren't turning this into a show, like UPN offers to buy it. <laughs> like, of course. Other TV networks are like, well, we'll make it into a show. I don't give a fuck. Yeah, we're I'm UPN. Here. All we have is Voyager reruns right now. Right. Like, <laughs> we're, we're UPN. Yeah. Please help <laughs> us. Most of, that most was of actually the their motto at the pod- time. Yeah, most of the people <laughs> listening to this podcast right now are like, I don't know what UPN <laughs> is. That's because this episode of our podcast will have more viewers than UPN got in its entire time on the air. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Um, But Mike Fleiss turns UPN down. He's like, no, I don't want to give this guy to you. And I I got a better idea. So Fleiss, who who had produced the show, um, takes a variation of the pitch that he and Darnell had made to ABC. Now, they clean it up a little for middle America, right? And they relaunch Who Wants to Be a Multimillionaire with some changes as a new series called, you ready for this, Dave? The Bachelor. Yeah. Yeah, baby. Yeah. That's where that starts. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Yeah. And obviously, The Bachelor is a lot less problematic, although not to I, they, look there. There's so much I've, lore in all of these shows. I'm sure people will be like, no, there's the, like, yeah, of course, a bunch of fucked up shit happened. There right. Too. It's tough. I've never yeah. seen a single episode of The Bachelor. No, no. Uh, and this is not about The Bachelor, but it's funny where it comes from. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Big Brother comes out later in 2000. It's after Who Wants to Be a Multimillionaire. And it's actually, this is interesting, Big Brother is an import of a Dutch show that's itself inspired by the real world, which is like this thing that increasingly, like up to this day, is big in reality where like some foreign country will make a show that's inspired by like these other shows and then like we'll steal that idea and then that'll like, I don't know, it's fine. Right, I've Um, noticed that like, I assume it's all owned by the same people, but it seems like... You just have to change like a few words. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not, it's not, honestly, there's not really a meaningful difference between like what they did with the office, you know, like that's not fucked up. It's just like the way art works. Like, right. Oh, I some just foreigner like, painted this thing. Like I'll it paint reminds a thing me of like, like that. game yeah. shows where it's yeah. like, you can legally make a slightly different version of this and it's yeah. fine. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, this is fine. I just bring it up because I find it interesting, not because it's like bad that they, imported the idea behind this dutch show like who gives a fuck so yeah the the war on terror starts not long after you know this this whole period of time um and sure as it gets down to the business of just like fucking up a bunch of stuff reality tv is becoming the biggest thing in u.s media the bachelor is a titanic hit basically overnight it becomes abc's top rated show among 18 to 49 year olds otherwise known as the demographic with money well, yeah. that's what we knew it as in 2000. The cool, the cool demographic that <laughs> yeah. smokes cigarettes. Yeah. yeah, definitely. That was in 2000, especially smoking yeah, some cigarettes. Of course. So despite the promises they'd made in the wake of their disaster with Rockwell, Fox committed themselves to reality TV more than any other network. 
Jennifer Posner writes, By February 2003, Fox was devoting a whopping 41% and ABC 33% of their sweeps offerings to reality shows. These percentages increased over the years, limiting the number of quality comedies and dramas available to viewers and reducing opportunities for union-represented actors, writers, and crew. Instead of firing their previously shamed reality guru, Fox promoted Darnell to executive vice president of alternative programming. So... They mm. it's they, they get to bust some unions and give a creep a, a good job. Isn't that nice? Yeah, that's that's the American dream right there. Good mm-hmm. for them. It is uh, nice. Yeah. That is an uh, we will not be getting into it enough, but that is a big part of like why reality is so popular with producers and stuff unions. like high level producers is like, well you can get a, you can get away from a lot of union shit with this. That is very true. Mm-hmm. You have people who work for a lot less. And you can and cut out the writers more. guild, you know. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's a uh, real bummer. Mm-hmm. It's v- very fun. Mm-hmm. So with that August title behind him, Darnell helped to bring to life a number of the most noteworthy early reality shows. There was 2001's Temptation Island, in which real-life couples were separated and tempted into adultery. Um, <laughs> unbelievable premise. Joe Millionaire, in which a bunch of women dated a guy they thought was a millionaire, only to realize he wasn't. Uh, right, isn't the twist at the end they give him a million dollars, too? They, get, they, get, they split like, it's either a million or half a million between him and the woman who agrees to go out with him after no, learning he's not rich like if she agrees to still go out with him then they both get money i don't know what the moral is there <laughs> yeah i mean there's no moral it's mike darnell this guy doesn't have morals right, to the it's things putting he bugs does. in a jar <laughs> yeah and, and just seeing what happens yeah it's just making tv uh yeah. in 2004's the swan a bunch of women are given plastic surgery and other risky surgical procedures so they can compete in a beauty pageant uh, oh man mike darnell baby Probably. He's the fucking, he's the Chuck Barris of fucking reality TV is what I'm getting from this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he just sat there all day and mm-hmm. he just came know, up with horrible up, things to do. Yeah, and killed for the government on the side. My favorite show he did was the short-lived series Mr. Personality, in which a woman dates a bunch of men wearing masks that they can't take off until the show ends. And so she has to pick the woman she wants to be with without oh, seeing they- them without a mask. They have one of those now, too. They have like a blind date one. But Dave, this one was hosted by Monica Lewinsky. Oh, (laughs) shit. (laughs) I mean, what we know about her now, it's like good for her. I'm I'm not going to condemn her for like, you got to like what other kind of, uh, for one thing, what other kind of jobs are open to you as Monica Lewinsky in the early 2000s? Like right. not a lot of hiring opportunities after going through that ringer. So yeah, get, get what you can, Monica. Yeah. But it's, it's incredible. It's extra. Like the opening to this Holy show is extremely shit. funny and we're just going to play it play now. It, please. Now for indoor Bo, who will go? It's the season finale of Mr. Personality. This season on Mr. Personality. Haley Valentine Arp, a 26-year-old single career woman from Atlanta, was introduced to 20 eligible men, their faces covered by masks. (laughs) Hopefully it won't matter what he looks like because he's touched my heart in a different kind of way. They look like... men range from unemployed to millionaires. Peacemaker masks. from NFL mascots. Well, hold on. Do yourself a favor. Look up the other Fox show, Secrets of Magic Revealed, with the masked magician. Oh, no. I'm almost certain they just reused those masks. I'm not... I mean, I haven't looked in a while. I'm going by memory. But it looks for like... People, for people who aren't watching this, they look like servants at an eyes wide shut orgy. Yeah. They, like, they, they all have the same masks. It, they all kind of look like MF Doom, but with a little bit of, like... Yeah. Uh... uh like the fucking Skeletor from the Masters of the yeah. Universe movie mixed I'm, in. I'm shocked that they it's all have so the same funny. mask. It's so funny. Here, yeah. Here's more. Motivational speaker with a strategy of mind control. Ever so <laughs> often, I kept hearing the number 17. 17. 80% of the way we get influence is really unconscious. Haley was forced to send 10 suitors packing. Their masks were removed. I think this totally sucks. The remaining 10 were given new colored masks, and the competition <laughs> kicked in. We're going to beat his ass. Haley watched wow. as a luau unraveled into Boys Gone Wild. That's what I'm talking about. Oh, God. This is my lovely bedroom. And two men eliminated themselves. Dude. This is what I'm just going to have to do. I can't do this. <laughs> 
<laughs> so another bit of context. Incredible. Like most reality TV, this is a men wearing tuxes and masks yeah. that takes place in what looks like a like upper upper middle class like McMansion. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. That's what's amazing about it too, is it's like an eyes wide shut orgy on a budget. Yeah. Like it's, <laughs> It's, it's, I'm not saying, I'm not saying I have this kind of money, obviously, mm -hmm. but it's like, this is like someone who owns like a tow truck company, like several yeah. their house, um, which again, nothing against that, but I'm just trying to, uh, it's like an eyes wide right shut picture. party, but all of the food is like from Kirkland, you know, it's yeah, like, Kirkland. Exactly. it's like a Kirkland like, a, brand, rich people orgy, <laughs> right? It's not, it's not not wealthy like these people have money but they, don't, they, they don't have that much can we, money. Can we they play got, the next clip please oh yeah okay, yeah okay. here's I, I i picked this one because it's got a little bit of that sweet Lewinsky action that i know everybody's looking for you right <laughs> she really is just kind of barely in it right that's Chris, monica behind the two time to announce. talking now Haley, he had initially said that he took your breath away and that you could get lost in his green eyes. <laughs> but you also best. said he seemed a little too smooth and a bit calculating. This is the mind control guy. He's a guy. motivational speaker and life coach <laughs> for teenagers. Oh, He's 30 years old in the dark green mask. Meet Chris Berg. Very wow. Funny. I love so, it. I love Chris it. Chris Berg, who's into mind control and motivation. Yeah, he sure theater, is. He there's sure There's no is. way he didn't die in a bar in Florida like 10 yeah. years ago. He either like, died he in a bar in stabbed. Florida. That or he was part of the CIA's enhanced interrogation program in Iraq. <laughs> like one of the two is yeah, this guy's it, background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's one or the other. Either yeah. he is in fact good at what he does or yeah, he's been stabbed in the stomach God. in a bar in Florida. What an uh, incredible show. Holy shit. It's so that, funny. It, there, it's like it's like junk food because mm -hmm. as soon as he was like, I'm going to take off my mask, I'm like, here we fucking go. I can't yeah, wait to see this yeah. fucking. Yeah, let's see this weirdo. And then he was just some honky. He's just some, he's just some, some honky. Yeah. Yeah. He's just it's, some fucking honky. It's, it's so it's funny. such a ripoff. I think it got like five episodes. Like, the, the, <laughs> well, which is why Monica all. Lewinsky is not a staple of reality TV to this day, which is uh -huh. tragic. Um, just in, you can see that he's just like throwing shit at a dartboard. Like, all right, let's put him in masks and let's get who's famous that people wouldn't expect to see in a show. Monica Lewinsky, offer yeah, her some it. money, put her in the show. Ah, oh, it didn't work. Whatever. They probably had a list. They probably yeah. like at one yeah. point, William yeah. Shatner was going to host, you know, like uh, it's probably just like, we have a list of people who we, we know will do it. Yeah. We know and we'll then, do it. They need work. And like, it'll, people will be like, well, what? I got I guess I'll try this. Yeah. 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 We're back. So, yeah. Uh, and it's worth... It, it is kind of interesting to me that, like, having just gone through this, the first reality show ever was, like, pretty complex and intelligent entertainment for its day, and there's some, like, real cultural value there. <laughs> but it, well, yeah. it, it winds up as this, you know? Because yeah. reality TV and documentaries mm -hmm. could be the same thing, right? Right, right. Like, if you're just documenting something that you find interesting, yeah. um, a, a slice of you know, life in America, like that family, yeah. like that makes sense. It's just, they realized quickly that's boring. And, and yeah, it, it, it's like, even you can see in shows that are still around, like the real world, when it debuted in 1992, it dealt with a lot of shit like AIDS and drug addiction and like LGBT right. issues in a way that was a lot of folks will argue, at least I'm not a comprehensive, I don't know much about the real world, but people who are critics of culture will argue was more intelligent than it is today. Um, cultural critic Latoya Peterson writes that while growth and development were early on parts of the real world, in later days it became, quote, specifically cast for racists, assholes, and agitators. It's like a formula. Every season has some huge racial altercation. Every season has some kind of woman trying to sleep her way into self-esteem. Every season has a guy coping with a breakup angrily. Right. Again, they, yeah. they they sought out people yeah. who were unstable. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then they gave them money and fame. 
Well, and also, uh, as we saw with the very first, with like Darnell's first show, and, and Posner notes that like a big part of this change is that folks follow Darnell's lead in baiting advocacy groups like the National Organization of Women or the NAACP or of GLAD course. with content that where people were like have controversies which will get these groups to weigh in which will cause like journalists to write about this controversy which generates press and views um yeah. and that's a big part of it too it's and hate the, clicks yeah it's, it's hate clicks it's, it's, it's all about hate clicks it's it's triggering the libs and mm -hmm. it's all built upon the same idea which is that like any reaction is there is a reaction therefore yeah. it succeeds even if the reaction is someone saying that's not funny they're yeah. like, we did it. And it's like, did you though? Like, it, it, it's funny to me that, that kind of what's happening here is the way bullies work, right? Which is like, if you react to them at all, you're giving them what they want. Right. That we have just applied to like all of culture now. And reality is kind of how that happens where it's like, well, I guess the way everything should work is that if you get people to react by being shitty, then, then the person being shitty wins. Right, exactly. Like, mm -hmm. if you run a show that's just someone going out in public and taking dumps in the the ground at a mall. All right, now, Dave, I told you that in confidence. We have our pitch meeting with VH1 in a week, and look, I, look, look, baby, it, you can have multiple versions of that. It's like volcano and deep impact. Mm -hmm. You can never get too much of mall shitter. That's <laughs> that's gonna be gold. And it's spinoff. Who wants to watch a multi millionaire shit <laughs> in a fucking uh, a Spencer's gifts? Exactly. Oh, that'd be great because people at first they'd be like, something smells like shit, but they'd look and there's all the novelty shit. There's all the fake poop and they're and like, the well, Spencer's gifts. Yeah. which one is it? Like one of them is God, I want to go into a Spencer's uh, gift and leave a real dump next to all the novelty ones. They wouldn't find it for months. <sighs> anyway, oh. this is going to be stolen by Fox in like yeah. a week and make somebody $47 million. I mean, that could legitimately be like a, a jackass. It sketch, could be. I it could be. Like. Yeah. In 2001, VH1 launched its celebrity block. The linchpin of this was the surreal life, based off the real world in which people who were only celebrities in the loosest sense of the world, like at this point, Flavor Flav, would live right. together on camera. Flavor Flav became a lot more famous later, but um, he was, you know, this is kind of what like blew him up into being a reality star. Sure. Uh, it was huge. Uh, the production company behind it, 51 Minds Entertainment, started spinning off. Next, from Entertainment Weekly, quote, That's when they found Megan Hauserman, a former Playboy model who appeared on season three of the WB turned CW reality competition, Beauty and the Geek. She and her partner, Alan Scooter Zackheim, took home the $250,000 prize. With her bombshell looks and sassy wit, Hauserman became a fan favorite on Rock of Love with Brett Michaels. Think The Bachelor, but with Poison's Michaels as its prize. And its spinoffs. <laughs> I Love Money and Rock of Love, Charm School. 51 <laughs> Minds decided to give the model her own show, Megan Wants a Millionaire. The funny thing about Megan was her stated ambition, which was to marry a millionaire, says Cronin. So we said, what if we filled a house with millionaires and they were competing for you as their trophy wife? <laughs> here we go. This is, um... Yeah. I sort of know what's to come here. Yeah. Now, this does not sound like a TV show premise to me, Dave. It sounds like a spell to end the world. But a it lot does. of a lot of studio executives were convinced it would be a hit. So VH1 <laughs> greenlights this motherfucker. In the casting notice, they asked for, quote, single men of the highest degree with a net worth of a million dollars or more. Now, rather than l rely entirely on traditional casting, they sent producers to nightclubs to throw parties where rich guys would audition by just, like, being at a nightclub. Um, right. These sound like the worst parties imaginable, That sounds, yeah, that sounds like a nightmare. Imagine working yeah. a no. service job no. at one of those parties. What an absolute, that's, I, oh, look, that's the, that you could write a horror movie just about one of these nights. There aren't a lot of ethical reasons to make and deploy a chlorine gas bomb using the chem cleaning chemicals commonly found in any bar, but this right. would have been one, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> I don't think they would have arrested you. Yeah. No, the guy <laughs> just, it would have been self-defense. <laughs> we yeah. all agreed this was self-defense. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, um, yeah, they, they do this thing. Um, and one of the men they find through this process is Ryan Jenkins, a 32-year-old real estate developer from Las Vegas. Mm. Mm, good Sounds so like far. a perfectly rounded individual that I'm sure will have no problems around him. 
Now, one uh, one casting producer later recalled of him, Ryan Jenkins had one of the best personalities on this planet. He was intriguing. He knew it. He wasn't the best looking guy in the world. He just had this charisma. So all reality shows have a process for vetting candidates. Mm -hmm. This was clearly necessary after the first millionaire show blew up due to its lead male being an abusive monster with a restraining order against him. Every network and production company, though, did this in a different way. The most rigorous shows included the kind of like applications included the kind of information you need to get a mortgage. You'd have to file out every address you'd ever had, every job you'd had. There were psychiatric uh, screeners, ink blot tests, etc. Entertainment Weekly continues. The other key component is the criminal background check, which involves, in part, searching court and arrest records in every county a candidate has ever lived. When it came time to run checks on all of Meghan's potential millionaires, VH1 turned to Collective Intelligence, a Washington state-based company the network had been working with since 2003. But Collective only specialized in U.S.-based criminal searches. So for Jenkins, a Canadian citizen, the company subcontracted out the search to another firm, Straight Line International. Ryan Jenkins' record came back clear, and he was invited to join the cast so this is gonna go mm, good it's gonna end seems well fine yeah he's a canadian you know they're, they're nice people sure no megan, problems there <laughs> megan wants to marry a millionaire launched on august 2nd 2009 and it is one of the cringiest shows i've ever experienced let's watch the introduction okay to live the life of milk and honey with a man who takes her there Gentlemen extraordinaire Megan wants a millionaire And what Megan wants, Megan gets Oh, yeah Yeah, 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 yeah What Megan wants, Megan gets That's that's the good stuff, Dave So, wait You already explained who Megan is, right? Yeah, she's a, a Playboy model Whose primary ambition is to marry a millionaire I still feel like saying, who does she think she is? It's just like, my God. All right. Yeah. I mean, good, uh, good for her, I guess. I mean, I don't no. know why I'm saying that. Definitely not good I for mean, her. I mean, good for her for wanting a millionaire and knowing what she wants. And I guess. And I assume this will end really happy with her getting a millionaire. Yeah. I mean, I think she gets rich eventually. So there you go. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Ryan Jenkins in this episode, like the first, the, it's interminably long. She's just like meeting all of these guys. It's unbelievably awkward. Um, some of them are like creepy old dudes who are like really weird and, and it's, it's whatever. Like it's, it's, it's the kind, they're all creepy in some way. They're all the kind of people who would show up on a show with this premise. Um, so it's horrible. And in his introduction, Ryan Jenkins describes himself as quote, a little bit of Prince charming, a little bit of a bad boy. And here's, <laughs> here's, here's him showing up on screen for the first time. Okay. Hello, Megan. Look, we're matching already. We are matching. Have you met any Canadians before? Never. Well, it's about time, don't you think? Absolutely. Can I let you in on a little secret? Please do. Ryan whispers in my ear, you're going to love Canadian bacon. Oh. (laughs) Oh, fuck. Fuck. That was a dick thing, right? I think, yeah, I think. Probably. I just lost a year of my life. Yeah, that that takes Uh. a lot out of you. My God, just the facial hair alone uh-huh. oh, should it's horrible. be illegal. I mean, this was, you know, the early 2000s. Everything Doesn't was worse. Doesn't matter. But yeah. No, I can't defend it. I know it no. was a different time back then, mm-hmm. but still, that yes. facial hair, you're going to love Canadian bacon? Was no, he sir. trying to say his dick's flat? Because... Yeah, flat and... Flat and not, not quite went. cooked right? Yeah. Yeah. Here's the, Here's the thing. If he was actually just talking about Canadian bacon, he'd be, that would be delightful, right? Mm-hmm. If he just wants to like cook her some Canadian but bacon. But Dave, sure. he was not. <laughs> no. He, no, no. He was not. But that would have made him a winner. He probably could have gotten all the way to the top that way. Mm. But no, yep. it's probably, yeah, about his like tapeworm dick, like his mm-hmm. flat, mm-hmm. floppy, his like, flat, weird... floppy tapeworm dick. Isn't Canadian bacon like round too? Like it's like a... It's wrong. It's not right. Like, yeah. it's, it's like poutine. You're not supposed to put it in your body. It just exists no. because we, you know, b- because America, the one time we pull our punches, 
It's with Canada. And look at this nonsense that exists right. now. Look what we let happen. I'm gonna yeah. I'm going to need Garrison to fact check everything you just said. <laughs> <laughs> so Ryan advanced to the final round of the show. Um Hauserman liked him, although she saw some quote unquote red flags, like the fact that his Rolex was fake and that he only brought a single pair of pants for five weeks of filming. Amazing. <laughs> All right. I, I wish I could. What a millionaire. Act, I wish I could act better mm -hmm. than him, but I do only own a single pair of pants. Dave, I know this about you, having lived with you, but also you're not a millionaire. That's true. I'm not. You're right. <laughs> you're definitely uh, not. Yeah, I can't. I, I can't afford multiple mm -hmm. pairs of pants. You're right. That's mm -hmm. why. Mm -hmm. That's why mm -hmm. I only have one pair. Mm hmm. I'm the victim here. You're right. So yeah, it's weird. Yeah, it is weird for him. Mm -hmm. It's weird for him. Yeah. Um, so she thought he was sweet um, and she almost picked him as the winner. She looked him up on Facebook one night during shooting and got his phone number and called him privately to tell him she planned to pick him. But Ooh. then she told the show's producers what she planned to do. And they were like, oh, no, absolutely not. Um, they justified this as saying he wasn't likable and was just putting on a show for her. And she eventually agreed to send him home. Quote, he was really upset. And I was upset also. Mm. Mm, so That's a shame. She planned to call him once filming was over and explain that she'd just been doing what her producers wanted. Right. The show flopped, but Hauserman remained in contact with Ryan. He told her that after she sent him home, he was so upset that, quote, I went to Vegas and I met a girl. Um, as is normally the case on reality shows, producers right. hired several of the failed contestants of this show for other projects. And so four years later, in 2009, Ryan Jenkins is cast for a show called I Love Money 3, vying sure. for a $250,000 prize because, you know, he's not actually a millionaire and he could really use the cash. Entertainment <laughs> Weekly continues. He kept calling her on the phone, his wife, saying, I'm going to win this and you and I are going to have the life I've always promised, recall recalls Mark Cronin, co founder of 51 Minds Entertainment, the this production company dark. behind Money, Megan the Surreal Life, and the majority of VH1's wildly successful celebrity shows of that era. Then he Fuck. would ask her, where were you last night? Because he's in Mexico shooting the show, and she lives in Las Vegas. He was very jealous and very suspicious of her. We were actually making a story of it on the show. We were like, look at this guy. He's obsessed with this model he married, Cronin continues. It was funny, until it wasn't funny at all. You want to uh, guess why it stops being funny? I have an idea. Yeah, yeah it's but, pretty bad. It's pretty, yeah. it's, it's not funny. Uh, on August 15th, 2009, soon after I Love Money 3 wrapped, uh, Fior, his, his wife's strangled and mutilated body was found stuffed in a suitcase, tossed Gee. into a dumpster in Buena Park, California. I um, wonder what happened. Yeah. So Jenkins oh. goes on the run. And as this all gets public, TMZ finds out that he has an extensive criminal record, um, including an arrest in 2005 for assaulting a girlfriend in Calgary, which VH1 and 51 Mind said was not on his background check. Uh, Jenkins eventually kills himself in a hotel room in British Columbia on August 23rd. Um, and yeah, it's this whole big story. Big, big, ugly oh. story for the reality TV industry. Yeah. Collective intelligence gets most of the blame for this, and they wind up laying off their workforce. Um, the whole nightmare reportedly leads to an increased willingness for production companies and networks to pay for thorough background checks. So that's good. It feels like everybody in America should go to jail for a day. It, uh, it feels like we all got to go to like, jail for that one. Yeah, it's, it's just like our culture, yeah. everything. Everybody... Yeah. You just feel clock bad. in for your shift and then you're the guard next because like we got to get through everybody. Right. It, it, we should all feel fucking ashamed. Yeah, if some just, new refugee comes into the country and it's like, hey, sorry, it's been so tough over in Ethiopia or Ukraine. Gra glad you're here. You got to go to jail for a day now. For a day. Yeah. There was this show like 15 years ago. <laughs> yeah. No one stopped it from happening. Nobody it stopped so it. Obvious that this person yeah. was. Yeah. Look, we know you're yeah. new here, but every American has some collective responsibility for this show. <laughs> right. I mean, listen, in our defense, he did say he was kind of a bad boy. So <laughs> this is this would fall under the us. kind of a bad boy ages. Yeah. He's like, that's what he actually whispered. He's like mm -hmm. in her ear. He's like, I'm a murderer. <laughs> I am. A, I'm I am a going to be a murderer. Yeah. 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 Oh, my fucking God. Now, the good news, Dave is that sketchy, violent dudes getting through vetting is no longer the main threat faced by reality shows. We're going to talk about what is 
in part two of this series. Dave, how you feeling? Yeah. How, how you liking reality? <laughs> is, is this, how am I liking reality? Yeah. Um, you know, a mixed feelings always on reality. Yeah. So, you know, can't, can't complain, but really I don't have many compliments for it either. Yeah. I, I feel the same about reality as I do about reality TV, which is I feel like we could do better. Yeah. Could yeah. I feel, I feel like we could do better, you know? Um, but you know, who's doing great, Dave is your mm-hmm. podcast network gamefully unemployed where people yeah. can listen to hype casts and hear about what's coming out in, in Hollywood. They can listen to Fox Mulder is a maniac and learn how the FBI definitely really functions. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It's been, it's in, our and, own, yeah. yeah, it's our own behind the bastards for yeah. Fox Mulder <laughs> and Fox Mulder mm-hmm. only. And it, yeah. Yeah. It, it's so detailed. In fact, that if you listen to every episode of Fox Mulder is a maniac, you are legally an FBI agent and can carry out raids and stings on whoever it's you true. want. It's true. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, the government might say otherwise, but it's like a little wink, wink. Yeah. Them, what do they you know? know? What do they know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. They're just fucking with you. Yeah. So yeah, everybody check that out. Mm-hmm. Uh, gamefully unemployed. Mm-hmm. Uh, gamefully uh, Patreon dot com dot. Uh, mm-hmm. Wait, I g- I can do it. Patreon dot com slash gamefully unemployed. Yeah, uh, we're on Twitter as well. Gamefully un, I think. I don't yeah, know. just Google something us. like that. Something just like Google. that. Yeah. All right. Google them and then Google yourself, but like in a sexual manner. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Your wow. name so plus. Let me just let nudes. that happen. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Google your name plus nudes. See what happens. Yeah. You'll, you'll get something. It yeah, won't yeah. be you won't be happy you got it, but you'll get something. Mm-hmm. Anyway, this has been the podcast. Yeah. I've been Robert Evans. You've been David Bell, and That's Sophie true. has been disappointed in me. Behind the Bastards is a production of Cool Zone Media. For more from Cool Zone Media, visit our website coolzonemedia.com or check us out on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.